It's a great pleasure to have Jonathan Fletcher to come to open God's word to us tonight. The chief love on his heart in terms of Christian work is Emmanuel Church in Wimbledon where he's the minister. He's one of the trustees of the Proclamation Trust which was one of the founding sponsors of Word Alive. He was on the steering committee of the Evangelical Students Conference which preceded and ran into uh, the student track here at Word Alive and he's been a great supporter of Word Alive and a great contributor to it in all manner of seminars over the Word Alive's existence. So we give you a very warm welcome and pray for God to use you to teach us his word. We're going to read part of the passage which Jonathan will open and then we'll pray and then we'll ask Jonathan to come and speak. It's Matthew chapter 23 and we read the first 15 verses. Matthew chapter 23. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must obey them and do everything they tell you but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for men to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels of their garments long, they love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted in the marketplaces and to have men call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have only one master and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called teacher, for you have one teacher, the Christ. The greatest among you will be your servant, for whoever exhorts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. Shall we pray? O Lord our God, the Holy One, these are serious and searching and inquiring words from your Son we have to confess that in our time and even today we have been play acting before you and other people and that it's natural to all of us by sin to want to be seen by others in the best light and to project ourselves and to appear other than we truly are we come to confess the deviousness of our hearts and how so often we are deceived by them into thinking better of ourselves than we ought. So hear our confession, we humbly pray. May we have reality before you and not hypocrisy. May we live in truth and in the light before you and not dabbling in darkness. We thank you that your son came to deal with people like this, like us. 
that he spoke these words and also came to be the one who would seek and save the lost and bring people out of unreality and evil and rebellion and guilt into the light of forgiveness and the glorious freedom of your children. May we know that as well in our experience. Humble us, but in this way lift us up as well to know and enjoy and live worthily of the pardon that comes to us through the shed blood of Jesus. Hear us then as we put ourselves before you. Teach us your word, guide us by your spirit, work in our minds and hearts and wills and lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Bob, so much. The title we have for this evening is Be Real in Your Religion, not like the Pharisees who did not practice what they preached. And it's a tough subject and a tough chapter, which I hope you'll have open in front of you. There's nothing comparable in the rest of the New Testament in terms of sustained denunciation of the lawyers and the Pharisees. There are snippets uh, elsewhere, but this chapter is mammoth and very serious indeed. And I don't know about you, but whenever I see the word Pharisee, I substitute Jonathan Fletcher. And I know that I'm in the center of the target. And when I read of these teachers of the law, I think of evangelicals, conservative, reformed, classical, fundamentalist. They say that the fundamentalist is someone who doesn't have enough fun, too much damn, and is decidedly mental. But anyway, <laughs> uh, we're in the center of the frame as we look at this chapter. Uh, a few of you will have heard of Morgan Robertson, but only a few, I guess. He was a very obscure novelist a hundred years ago, and he wrote a book about a fabulous ship that sailed the Atlantic. And as it sailed, it was full of the rich, the famous, and the easygoing. And one April night, this ship hit an iceberg and sank. And the theme of the book was the utter futility of everything, the striving after wealth and pleasure. In fact, the book's title was Futility. Nobody read it. Fourteen years later, the White Star Line built a ship, in fact and in reality, with very similar proportions. The real ship had a 66,000 tonne displacement. The ship in Morgan Robertson's novel had a 70,000 tonne displacement. The real ship was 882 feet long. Morgan Robertson's was 800 feet long. Both had three large propellers. Both could speed at about 24, 25 knots. Both could carry 300 passengers, but only had lifeboats for a fraction of that number. But it didn't matter because both were unsinkable. On April the 10th in 1912, the real ship set sail from Southampton, carrying passengers that had insured themselves at Lloyd's for what was then I think 250 million pounds. And she too, on a cold April's night, hit an iceberg and sank. She was, of course, the Titanic. Morgan Robertson had called his ship, in his novel that nobody read, the Titan. The early 20th century was a time of tremendous confidence that man was going to conquer everything, disease, poverty, war, and he was going to do it all through technology. And it was all encapsulated in the building of a ship that couldn't sink. As the Titanic was going down, one deckhand was asked whether everything was all right. And he replied, God himself couldn't sink this ship. Uh, apparently, one of the, the builders of the ship 
in the, the building yard, stuck up a notice saying, I defy God to build this ship. And on that April night, God took up that challenge. It was described as an act of God. A 330 foot gash was torn in the side of the ship and still the officers were saying, no danger. Down the years since then, politicians have said, no danger. And today, church leaders and bishops are saying, no danger, no danger. But in the chapter that we have in front of us, Jesus is saying exactly the opposite. Woe to you, woe to you, you religious people, you leaders, you ministers, you house group leaders, you Sunday school teachers, you leaders of youth groups. Woe to you if you do not practice what you preach. And not just to the leaders. It's made clear in verse 36 that it refers to the whole generation of those who might call themselves believers, but they're not real in their religion. They're just hypocrites. As we've heard in the prayer, the hypocrite is the play actor. It's the key word of the chapter. It comes six times in verses 13, 15, 23, 25, 27, 29. Now, I take this chapter very personally and very seriously. It's an especially serious problem because hypocrisy, which is their big problem, hypocrisy blinds. After the word hypocrite, the commonest word in the chapter, comes five times, is blind, blind. It's the hardest thing to convict people of. You can show someone their immorality, their violence, or their theft, and they say, fair cop. But when it comes to hypocrisy, the beam is so big in our own eyes that we just don't see it. It doesn't seem to apply to us. We don't see it. We don't see straight. Not only does hypocrisy blind, it wreaks havoc in the lives of others. And if they're leaders, they're blind leaders. And they lead, lead people to destruction. The artist Bruegel has a very dramatic picture of a blind leader leading other blind people. They're just toppling over into the pit. And of course, it puts the world off. The thing that the world cannot stand about Christians is hypocrisy. And in this chapter, it is so serious because it comes under the censure and the condemnation of the Lord Jesus. He describes them as fools and sons of hell. And when he says, woe, it's not personal irritation. It's, it's the language of divine warning. He is saying, danger, danger. There are seven woes that are mentioned in this chapter, uh, at least in the New International Version. I think the authorized version had uh, eight, but the NIV leaves out uh, verse 13. We could go through them one by one. Others have spotted something which the pundits called a chiasmus, which is a Hebrew device. When you have an odd number of things, say seven as you have here, you put one and seven together, two and six, three and five, and you center on the, the major one, four. Uh, and they seem to be seeing this, these pundits, everywhere. I am not quite convinced of this yet. I could go through them one by one, but what I'm going to try and do is to pick out five key marks of the hypocrite, the person who is not real in their religion, who does not practice what they preach, to whom the Lord pronounces a worm and warns of danger. If you like, the marks of the so-called evangelical whose religion is not real. Here's the first mark. These people like to impress. They like to impress. And that came in the passage that Bob read a moment ago in verses 5 to 11. Of course they like to impress. They're actors. And that's what acting is, is all about. Uh, there was an Australian lawyer, who uh, the story is told, who was uh, an atheist. And he began reading his Bible, 
without seeing anybody, and through just reading the Bible, he, he was converted. He became a Christian. And then he went on reading his, his Bible to try to work out what sort of church he ought to go to. And he came to Matthew 23. And he discovered that he ought to avoid a church where the leaders liked special clothes, special seats, and special titles. He realized that he couldn't go to an Anglican church. <laughs> special clothes, as uh, they all dress up. The story is told of the late and great David Watson, when he was a, a curate, uh, was invited to go and help out at a, a local church where the rector was away. It was of a completely different uh, tradition. So he thought it would be a courteous thing to put on all the full rig and dress up like the, the Mikado. And he did that and uh, is in the vestry. And just before he uh, went in to take the service, he turned to the verger and said, asked whether he got everything on right. And the, the verger said, well, Rector doesn't normally wear the bookmark, but... Uh, <laughs> special seats so that everybody else is in pews and they're up in special seats and special titles reverend and right reverend and very reverend and most reverend and not so reverend and hardly reverend <laughs> if you've smiled or laughed at that and you're not an anglican <laughs> i am I've chosen to be one, so it tells you what I think of your show. <laughs> the special clothes are not just the uh, prerogative of any particular group. Our youngsters do it, don't they? As uh, they all dress up in, in leather and the girls have more moose than brains and the... <laughs> And increasingly, blokes have sort of chandeliers. From the... <laughs> but it's not just them, and it's not just Anglicans, actually. Elders of a local church processing in, framed copies of diplomas and degrees, people itching to be part of a platform party, speakers wanting their names in print, clergy wanting their names on their notepaper, at one convention, the, the punters apparently were trying to do a, an assessment of all the different pullovers that the speakers were wearing and the different hairdos of their wives. Now, the contrast between the, the play actor who's wanting to impress, we read in verse 11, the greatest among you will be your servant, for whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. The person who is real in their religion will be marked by self-effacing lowliness. He took a towel, girded himself, and washed the disciples' feet. Have you seen films of uh, Eastern potentates and sheikhs sitting on masses of cushions and <laughs> slapping their hands and calling for another pipe or another fan or another wife or something like that? <laughs> the Lord Jesus was the opposite, wasn't he? What can I do for you? Master, I'm blind. What can I do for you? My servant is sick. What can I do for you? My daughter is dying. What can I do for you? I'm a leper. Throughout his life, self effacing lowliness. So the first mark of the false teachers, those who are not real in their religion, is that they like to impress. Secondly, they impose burdens. They impose burdens. Did you notice that in verse 4? They tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move any of them. They make it harder for people to, be, to believe and become disciples. They put blockages in the way. And that's ever the way of religion. It's why religion is such a curse. Because these folk invent rules which replace the commandments of God. 
And because these leaders feel that their rules are so important, they have to proselytize. We read of that in verse 15. Woe to you, teachers of the law, Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, to proselytize. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. You lay burdens on them. They tracked others to keep their own particular rules, to tow their lines. This was the issue, of course, that uh, St. Paul faced uh, with the Galatians. They'd become Christians. They'd begun with the Spirit, the only way there is to begin. They were fine. And then a party came down from Jerusalem and said that if they were to be really paka, really kosher, then they had to revert to Judaism and to keep all the Jewish rules as well. Paul says, very striking, he says, if you do that, what you'll be doing is be reverting to paganism by having all those religious rules imposed on you. The same thing happened with the Church of Rome at the time of the Reformation, which is why Luther, in expounding Galatians, applied it all at that time, quite rightly, to Rome. Because of all the rules and the regulations, the burdens, that just made it harder for people. And today, perhaps evangelicalism with evangelical keenness, a whole list of shibboleths, details about Sunday observance, rules about alcohol or gambling, which version to use of the Bible, which hymn book, all tight rules that can be imposed. And what I learned from this, if I am to be real, in my religion is that I must never, never impose on somebody else's discipleship anything beyond scripture. In fact, living according to the word is the theme of the whole chapter. And these folk were imposing things beyond scripture. And I will also beware of those groups that proselytize other Christians to try to win them over to their little way of doing things, whether it's uh, trying to make them Anglicans or any other particular group. Rather, the person who is real in their religion and their discipleship and in a position of leadership sets people free, doesn't want them to be clones. At one church in which I worked, there was a, a delightful eccentric. He could whistle any aria from any opera he always wore a tie and a jacket when he sat on the beach, and I believe, I believe he had turn-ups in his pajamas. <laughs> and I, I said to him, he came quite a distance to our church across London, and I, I said to him, you know, why do you take all the trouble to come here, hoping that it would be something about the brilliance of the preaching or something like that? And he said, I like coming here because I'm allowed to be myself. I'm free. That's right. The third mark of the, the false teacher, the, the Pharisee, the person who's a hypocrite, is that they major on minors. They get everything out of proportion. Let me read the, the next uh, chunk. I'm getting out of my glasses on. You probably know that little rhyme. To my deafness I'm accustomed, to my dentures I'm resigned. I can cope with my bifocals, but oh dear, I miss my mind. I'm... <laughs> I'm only just beginning to cope with my um, bifocals. <laughs> Verse 16. Woe to you, blind guides. You say, if anyone swears by the temple, means nothing, but if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he's bound by his oath. You blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing, but if anyone swears by the gift on it, he's bound by his oath. You blind men, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and everything on it. And he who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. 
Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, swallow a camel. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. The clear implication of the Lord Jesus here is that there are weightier, more important matters of the law from verse 23 that are more central and more decisive. And the appeal, therefore, is to the balance and proportion of Scripture. Whereas these evangelical Pharisees picked on secondary issues. Now, sometimes this can be quite tricky. A couple of years ago, at the first Word Alive, John Stott gave an impassioned and marvellous and quite right appeal for evangelical unity and that we should concentrate on the major issues rather than on the minor ones. But the trouble is that some people aren't able to distinguish between the two and for them what is a minor thing very quickly becomes a major thing. And the question is how do we decide what is minor and what is major? And the answer again must be scripture. If it's not in the New Testament, it's clearly totally unimportant. Don Carson, at a brilliant seminar here last year, made this point. If a thing is only mentioned once, or possibly twice, don't major on it. Of course, God only needs to say something once for it to be authoritative, but we're so stupid that God in his graciousness, if it's important, tends to say it again and again and again. But if it's only once, possibly twice, then it must be a secondary issue. Hats in church, a big distinction between ruling and teaching elders, uh, bishops. Well, it's not altogether clear that they're in scripture at all, but uh, uh, if they are, they must be the secondary. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the millennium, the millennium is that era of peace that Christians love to fight about. <laughs> Our Lord does not decry mint and dill and come in, and he has that delightful little illustration, verse 24, the people who are straining at, straining at a gnat, they don't want to swallow a gnat, but the absurdity of swallowing a camel. But the greater importance of concentrating on the major things of justice, mercy, faithfulness. Justice, that is being fair in Anglican circles. Clergy, not exploiting laity. In some free church circles, laity, not exploiting their minister. Uh, minister uh, mercy, the restoration of a brother or sister who has fallen into sin. Faithfulness, that reliability. It's just the tendency in some places that because Christian work for many is uh, voluntary, doesn't have to be done quite so faithfully. The prophet Jeremiah said, cursed is he who does the work of the Lord with slackness. You get all fussed about mill and dill and mint and cumin, but you're not very reliable. Shouldn't you concentrate on justice, mercy, and faithfulness? So if the first mark of the person who is to be real in their religion is self-effacing lowliness, and the second mark is that of setting people free, not imposing burdens, and the third mark is a glorious wholesomeness, 
a glorious common sense, a sense of balance and proportion that doesn't major on minors. The, th the fourth mark of the person who doesn't practice what they preach and who's not real in their religion is that they lack integrity. They lack integrity. We had it in verses 25 and 26. Let me read on 27 and 28. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. That's a new word that's introduced here. It's lawlessness. The outward show doesn't correspond to the inward reality. There's a mismatch, and therefore no real integrity. This person's regularly at Keswick, or Word Alive, or at the church prayer meeting. They'll be at a Maundy service, Maundy Thursday service, or at a Good Friday meditation, and certainly they're on Easter Day. They never miss the house group. They're pillars of the local church outwardly. But at home or at the office, it's very different. In the family, there are huge rages. Oh, the family don't split because they know that their own behaviour is equally vulnerable. But it's a far cry from what is thought about them at church. They sign protests about permiss the permissive society and immoral bishops. But they let their eyes linger on the top shelf of the newsagent. They speak much about honesty, but they've still got their butlin's coffee mugs. <laughs> there are great declarations about the Bible as the word of God, but the statistics today apparently show that the level of personal quiet times amongst evangelicals has never been so low. Make these great pro protestations about the Bible being the word of God. Don't actually read it. They go in for lawlessness. In the last result, resort, verse 28, they follow their own inclinations. And the Lord Jesus says, be real in your religion. Let the inward match the outward. Let there be that integrity that is the mark of true reality in your discipleship. It was said of a Christian friend of mine, his life can bear inspection at every point. His life can bear inspection at every point. I, I live in... Um, Wimbledon, and there's a certain amount of uh, tennis played there for a couple of weeks a year. And um, a number of our folk at our church uh, give hospitality to some of the Christian players, and they, they stay in the, their homes. And uh, these folk held a, a barbecue for some of the Christian players. In fact, it was, uh, I didn't organize, it was held in my garden. And they brought over with them from the States, a lot of them mainly American, a very, very fine pastor from Atlanta. And I gave uh, one of these tennis players uh, a, a lift home to where he was staying. Uh, well known, he's got three Wimbledon titles. Uh, and I asked him about his uh, Christian life and how it had begun. And he told me how he had moved from New York to Atlanta to go to this pastor's church. And I said, why did you make that big move? Well, he said it was partly the teaching but it was much more than that. He's had me into his home. I've seen him with his family. We've gone fishing together. We've played golf together. And there is a consistency, an integrity. It's all of a piece. There isn't a mismatch. But with these folk, they did not practice what they preached. Outwardly, in the assembly, the church meeting. Oh, very impressive, pillars but a far cry from what they were like in private. And then lastly, they honoured dead heroes. 
Verse 29, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, who build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our forefathers, we would have not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourself that you are descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of the sin of your forefathers. I have to be careful at this point because on the walls of my study I have got pictures of D.L. Moody, Sankey, Spurgeon, Ryle, Shaftesbury, General Booth and Charles Simeon, all the heroes of the past and all of whom were vilified in their day. And there is always going to be virulent hostility to God's true messengers. And what these bogus hypocrites were doing were honouring people once they were dead, but weren't standing up for them while they were alive. And that is the mark of someone who's not real in their religion. Now you probably know that in this century, people like uh, Billy Graham and John Stott were hugely vilified. The letters in the papers when Billy Graham first came over were horrendous and very, very, very few stood up for him in those days. Now, this is taking a new form, I think, in this century. Brought home to me in a, a brilliant essay by C.S. Lewis, entitled Bulverism. He has an imaginary couple called Mr. and Mrs. Bulver. Mr. Bulver, on one occasion, says, um, uh, Queen Elizabeth was a great queen, and Mrs. Bulver says, you only say that because you're a man. Now, do you see the point? Instead of tackling the issue of whether Queen Elizabeth I was a good or a bad queen, she tries to go behind it to find out what made him say it. And that is what is happening again and again. Rather than facing the issues, people are saying, well, what, what, what made him say it? Uh, the Archdeacon of York has written, re re recently written a, a book critical of the uh, authorities in the Church of England, and people have said, oh, he's only said that because he's not a bishop himself. He's, uh, he's, he's feeling uh, upset about it all and sneering, rather than actually tackling the issues. And so often I'm hearing people say of those who are standing up for the truth, oh, I actually do agree with what they're saying, but I don't like the way they're saying it. Will you stand with them? Oh, I'm not sure that I will. But do you believe what they say? Yes, I believe what they say. But they didn't like the way they're saying it. And therefore, they're joining the opposition. A friend of mine over from Australia this last winter was appalled by the number of Anglican evangelicals who were not prepared to put their heads above the parapet and stand up alongside those who were fighting for biblical morality and biblical truth. No doubt that once those people are dead, they'll be honored. But while they're actually fighting it in this world, people don't want to know. Whereas the one who is real in their religion stands beside and stands up for those who are fighting and championing the truth. Now, is there someone here who is saying, Matthew 23, it's very inappropriate, isn't it, for the last night of Word Alive? No, it's very appropriate. Wouldn't it be dreadful if we went back to our homes and our home churches and people said of us, you hypocrites, all that time at Word Alive, you're not real in your religion. It's very important that we live out in the days ahead what we've learned these past few days. Is there someone here who is saying, this is irrelevant, it doesn't apply to us. No danger. They're in the most dangerous situation of all. Look at the closing verses of our passage. The last public words of our Lord to Israel, perhaps the saddest that ever fell from his lips. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, 
you who killed the prophets and stoned those who sent you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under his wings. But you weren't willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you see, say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Is there someone here who is saying, ah, I'm beginning to feel very uncomfortable. The cap is fitting too tightly. I am in the frame. Well, then this chapter comes as good news because the message is always that of repent and trust the Lord for forgiveness. And as we'll be thinking on Good Friday, his arms are outstretched to welcome the penitent sinner back. And how magnificent if all those that were alive go home to be real in their religion, self-effacing in their lowliness, setting people free, liberating, rather than imposing burdens beyond scripture, with that wholesome common sense, balance and proportion of scripture, with an integrity so that the inward matches the outward, and with that courage that is prepared to put its head above the parapet and stand alongside those fighting for biblical truth. God grant that that will be the mark of each and every one of us. Amen. Thank you, Jonathan. It's very important as we come to this point of an evening like this to, to approach it thoughtfully. In a moment, we're going to sing a song as uh, those parents leave to pick up their children. Uh, and I want us to spend the next few minutes after that in different ways responding prayerfully to a message that's very searching for all of us. Will you turn to number 143, which some of you learnt before we came in. Now, this is based on Psalm 139, whether shall I go from God's presence? And it's a very searching word in the Psalms and the hymn picks it up. We'll stand and sing as those who must go out to pick their children leave us. And let's sing it thoughtfully. One, four, three.